Happy New Year and welcome to Living Truth, a media ministry of the People's Church. Wherever you're tuning in from, we're thrilled that you've decided to join us for our time of worship and teaching as we grow in God's Word together. What an incredible Christmas season we've had together. Thank you for joining us as we look ahead to a new year. We're blessed to hear from Peter Chu today as he shares from the Word of God with us. Our text today is Genesis 16. It is a story of Hagar, and it describes a God who sees and hears. When God sees, it is more than just being aware of our existence. When God sees, He cares. For God to see, He cares. And when He cares, he acts. Our story begins with the two words, now Sarah. Those two words indicate that we're into the next episode of the Abraham story. And to recap what has gone on before, you need to look at the preceding chapters. And there we find that Abraham has been given a command. Go, leave your people to a distant and unfamiliar land. But the command is paired with a promise. The promise has three parts. I will give you land. I will give you lots of descendants and make them into a great nation. I will bless you so that you can be a blessing. There's a problem, though. All the promises depend on Abraham having a son, and he doesn't have one. There's a little short verse at the end of chapter 11 where we find that Sarah was barren. She had no children. The repetition emphasizes the comprehensiveness of Sarah's childlessness. She was barren. She had no children. Now, what are the options for Abraham to have a son? He could have a son with Sarah. He could have a son with a woman other than Sarah, or just not Sarah. Now, one option is adoption. He could adopt a relative, Lot. He could adopt a trusted servant. That was a custom in the ancient Near East. If it's with another woman, he could pursue surrogacy. An ancient Eastern custom was Abraham would sleep with one of his wife's maidservants. The child that was born would be classified or considered as Sarah's. Another option was he could take a second wife. In Genesis 13, God eliminates Lot. He's not a candidate, Abraham, sorry. In chapter 15, God eliminates Eliezer, the trusted servant that Abraham thought he was now having to adopt. The other thing God makes very clear in Genesis 15 is That son would come from Abraham, but he was silent about who the mother would be. Abraham, you're going to be the father. He doesn't say anything about who the mother will be. That is where things stand when we enter chapter 16. In the first two verses, we're introduced to the characters that will be in our story. The first character is Sarah. She's introduced by her given name. Then we are told her position, her relationship. She is Abraham's wife. The next thing we're told creates tension. She's Abraham's wife, but she had borne him no children. The introduction to Sarah emphasizes her childlessness. But all the promises depend on having a son. The next thing we find out is what Sarah does have. She doesn't have children, but she has an Egyptian slave named Hagar. Then we're introduced to her perspective on her situation. The Lord has kept me from having children. She acknowledges that this is God's hand at work. There is no question, there's no debate. God has prevented me from having children. God has said no 
to Sarah. When God says no, the no can be in several forms. There can be the definitive never, ever no. The no can be the no of not yet, or not this, or not this way. The only way we find out which type of no it is, we have to wait. But Sarah is not willing to wait. Go, sleep with my slave, perhaps I can build a family through her. On the one hand, she acknowledges God has said no. On the other hand, she's rejecting that no. She is reaching out and taking what God has said is off limits to her. Now, if you remember, very early on, two other individuals reached out and took something that God said, you cannot have this. There are echoes of Genesis 3 running through the story that we're going to go through today. And this is the first point of reflection for us this morning. What is our response when God says no? What is our response when God says no? Do we accept it in trust, trusting that God is good? He is not cruel. He is not withholding something from us. God is good. And that we trust that the no is for our good. Or do we reject his no and defiantly take, go, and do, and be what we want? What is our response when God says no? The next character we're introduced to is Hagar. We're told four things about Hagar. She's Egyptian, she's a slave, and then at the very end, we're told her name, which is different from how we're introduced to Sarah. We're given Sarah's name from the beginning. But Peter, I thought you said there were four things. You have to read very carefully. She, Sarah, had an Egyptian slave. The fourth thing about Hagar, and the first thing in her description is, she's a possession. Sarah had her. She's owned by somebody. And that's why her name is pushed to the very end of her description. Her identity, her personhood is overshadowed by the fact that she belongs to someone else. She has no right, no voice, nothing. She's owned. This is our introduction to Hagar. The last character is Abram. It's a very short introduction. Abram listened to what Sarah said. Who should Abram have been listening to? Remember, the last time, some, last time God said no, two people listened to an individual other than God. The echoes of Genesis 3 are running through this. What is our response when God says no? Abram brings us to our second point of reflection. Who are we listening to? Are we focused and tuned in to God? And are we able to block out all the other noise, all the other voices? Well, they carry out the plot. Sarah, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. Notice the verbs, took and gave. Hagar's an object. And the dynamics within the family are turned upside down. The slave girl now becomes a wife. The wife has to share her husband, co-wife. Maybe she might consider herself the first wife, but she's also the older wife. And you actually wonder, did Sarah really give Hagar to Abraham? 
Or did she give Abraham away to the servant girl? In the same way Abraham gave her away to Pharaoh several chapters earlier. Hagar gets pregnant. And as the reader, you know, this is not going to end well. <laughs> because the slave girl started off beneath her mistress. Once she was married and became a wife, she's equal to her mistress. As soon as she gets pregnant, her status is now above her mistress. The reader knows this is not going to end well at all. Sure enough, when she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Sarah is not happy. And she lashes out at everybody around her. Abraham, it's your fault. You are responsible. Echoes of Genesis 3. It's not my fault. It's your fault. Okay? Sarah, I'm the victim. The wrong that I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now she knows she is pregnant. She despises me. Sarah is not taking responsibility for her actions. What she is emphasizing is her victim status. I did this for you, Abram. I did this for us so that we could have a son, and now look what has happened. She lashes out at Hagar. She despises me. And then lastly, she invites God into the conflict. She invokes God's judgment because she believes in the rightness of her position. I'm right, and I'm going to ask God to verify and vindicate that I'm right. It's very interesting that she never invited God into her childlessness in verse 2. But now when her scheme blows up, she invites God. Abraham's response, same thing as before. He listens to his wife. He says three things. Your slave is in your hands. Do with her whatever you think best. In those three statements, Abraham produces four effects in the family now. First, he has demoted Hagar from being his wife back to being a servant. Second, by doing so, in effect, he divorces her. You're no longer my wife. You are back to being Sarah's servant. Third, that leaves Hagar defenseless. She's no longer under the authority and the protection of Abraham. And fourth, besides no longer being her husband, Abraham abdicates his role as the head of the household. He is not there to affirm justice and fairness. He washes his hands, Sarah, do whatever you want. And Sarah does. She mistreats Hagar, and the word mistreat is the same word that we find in Exodus to describe the treatment of the Israelites by the Egyptians. Mistreat, deal harshly, to oppress. Hagar runs. She runs into the desert. Now, let's stop for a moment and take stock of who actually runs into the desert. You have a young person, a young female. She's Egyptian, which means she's an outsider. She's not part of Abraham's family. She's a servant. She's pregnant and divorced and a single mom. She's running away from abuse. She's a refugee. She's a mess. And she runs into the desert. Who would care if she died? Nobody except God. And that's exactly what happens. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring. Now, the angel of the Lord is a character that appears about 50, 60 times in the Old Testament. It is God appearing in human form in the Old Testament. What's debated is, 
which person of the Trinity? Is it God the Father showing up or God the Son showing up? Okay? But I think the bottom line is God shows up in visible form. And he visits with us. This is the very first appearance of the angel of the Lord in Scripture. And it is to Hagar that he appears. Young woman, servant, single mom, pregnant, divorced, outsider. He doesn't appear to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses. He appears to Hagar. First visit, it's to her. He says seven words to her. And in those seven words, what I hope you will see is that when God sees and God hears, he cares. And when he cares, he acts. The first thing he says is, Hagar. In contrast to how she was defined in verse 1 and verse 3, he doesn't say, hey, Egyptian maidservant Hagar. He actually places her name, her given name at the very beginning because he is affirming her personhood. I see you, Hagar, not the Egyptian, not the maidservant, not the single mom, not the divorcee. I see you, Hagar. But he does go on and say, maidservant of Sarah, he affirms her place. And that is followed up by two rhetorical questions. Where have you come from? Where are you going? The angel knows where she came from. He identifies her by name. He says, you're a slave girl. Your mistress is Sarah. The question is put to Hagar. You're not where you're supposed to be. And that's the third point of reflection I have for us this morning. Where have we come from? Where are we going? Are we where we are supposed to be? Where are we going? Are we where we're supposed to be? And then God gives her two commands. The first command is, go back. You got to be kidding me. I was expecting rescue, redemption. Go back, return. If you look ahead in the verse 11, the Lord has heard of your misery. God knew exactly the circumstances she was in, and he's saying, go back to your misery. In fact, second command, submit to your mistress. The phrase literally is, put yourself underneath her hand. Not only go back, but God actually calls out Hagar, hey, your attitude was wrong, and you precipitated this conflict. Change your attitude. God's presence can be assuring. God's presence is also disturbing because he holds us to account but he's sending Hagar back. And what he's doing in effect is he is now saying no to her. I'm not letting you leave. I want you to go back. And just like he has said no to Sarah, he's saying no to Hagar. You can't leave. What's Sarah's response? She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. And then she names the well accordingly. Sarah's response is one of worship. In contrast, sorry, Hagar's response is one of worship in contrast to Sarah's when God says no. Hagar's realized I'm not just talking to a regular man. This is God. And she understood that this God had showed up, made himself known to her, and cared for her. And in response, she worships. She understood that for God to see, it meant that God cared for her. 
Why should she worship? Her circumstances haven't changed. God said, go back to the misery of your life and submit, change your attitude to your mistress. She worshiped because Hagar realized what she didn't need was removal from her circumstances. What she needed was God who cared for her. And in response to that meeting of God, she worships him. What happened to her in the desert by the side of the road in the spring was her burning bush experience. Just like Saul, Paul meeting Jesus on the road to Damascus, she met God and her life was changed forever. The story ends very quickly. Hagar bore Abram a son. Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. Hagar returns to Abram and Sarah as God commanded her. Uh, God fulfills his promise, the son is born. And Abram names his son Ishmael, implying that Hagar probably told him what had happened, what the angel had said to her. And Abram believed the truth of what the angel had said. What is our response when God says no? Think very carefully about that. Let me close by going over the four reflective points that I had. The first is, whose voice are we listening to? Whose voice are we not listening to? The second question, where are we going? Am I where I'm supposed to be? The third question, do I see the way God sees? When God sees, it's more than just awareness of existence. When he sees, he cares. And because he cares, he acts. When I see the people around me, do I care? Do I act to change their circumstances? The fourth question is, what is our response when God says no? Do we trust that he's good and the no is for our good? Or do we say, no, God, I'm going to say no to your no, I'm going to take and do and go and be what I want. The last question, who cares about us? Remember who Hagar is. She's young. You may be thinking, I'm young or I'm old. God doesn't care about me. Hagar's young, she's a woman, she's Egyptian, she's an outsider. She's a servant girl, single mom, pregnant, divorced, she's running away from abuse, she's a refugee, she's a mess. Not someone you would think the God of the universe would care about, but he did. Hagar's story points to the ultimate demonstration of God's care and love for us, and that is Jesus Christ, who we have been celebrating over this Christmas holiday. For God so loved the world that he gave his son, that whoever, all-inclusive, comprehensive, the world, whoever, and then it's extremely exclusive, believes in him. Sarah said, I have met the God who cares for me.
blessed to worship and learn with you. If you're feeling led to support or learn more about our ministry, visit us online at livingtruth.ca. You can also call the number on your screen to donate. Thanks for joining us today. We look forward to worshiping with you again next time.